Hunter, since there are two moderators. Okay, no, you can moderate everything. Well, no, I'm not happy to, to share I don't, I don't know, you have the... I did, I did a quick I did a quick study. I can do a quick bio on each of our panelists. Okay, that's that was fine. A, that that's was difficult, yes, given the difficult. distinguished panel, and there's so <laughs> much to say. So, <laughs> but uh, uh, I think I, uh, just, I can do just that. Just say, asshole, when you introduce me. <laughs> <laughs> I won't do that. <laughs> and, and then if you want, Mauricio, what you could do, here's the cases, oh, okay. and here's the individual presenting, and there's a little information about each one. So okay, you can perfect. introduce them as the Interventional Fellows at the University of Oklahoma, so you can use that. Okay. And if you want, you can uh, uh, tell which case, call it up, and tell who's presenting. Okay, we and, uh, almost one yeah, minute we, we need to begin, right? We have how many? We have a bunch of cases. Yeah, we do. One is not coming. Uh, this one gentleman here uh, from the Egypt. Perforation battle. Yeah, he had issues with his visa. Okay. So at the last minute, that shouldn't happen. That's disappointing. So so where is, where is here in the, in the program? Are we here in the yeah, program? Yeah, we're here. Here we are in this hearing box right here. We're here. So uh, Coronary track. Yeah. Coronary challenge. So we have to pick two cases, all of mm -hmm. us together. Each of us pick two cases, and then we can tally it up and decide which two. Here. Are. This is. Yeah. Okay. That's it. Dallas. Dallas. Yeah, Dallas VA and at UT Southwestern. Oh, with, uh, there. with Subash. Subash. Subash is my boss. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. I work in the lab with him okay. doing interventional is he cardiology. Leaving? I heard that he's, he's leaving. leaving. Where is he going? He's going to down across the street to Baylor University Medical Center. He's taking over. He'll be the editor in chief of Jack. He's taking over from Bill Roberts, and they made him a, a sweet deal with a big research. Uh, you know. Oh my gosh. Oh my God. He's a talented guy, right? He's a great guy, and uh, you still have family in Argentina. I do. Yeah. I do. So you, we're MOTs, right? A member of the tribe. Oh, we are. Okay, yeah. Great. So yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I learned in I've, Miami. <laughs> I've I've, uh, I've walked, come to meetings over the years, and I always enjoy uh, listening to you, and I've learned much well, from thank you. Thank you so, so much. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. What do you think? Uh, should we get started? Yes. Say thirty-one. Yeah. It's all taped down. I didn't set this. Room. So it's, yeah, it's literally. Okay. Okay. Okay, great. Good morning. Uh, I'm Jerry Groden, and uh, I'm from the Dallas VA. I'm one of the moderators today, along with Dr. Mauricio Cohen. And uh, we have a very distinguished panel. I'll, uh, it's difficult to give a bio on any of these very accomplished uh, 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 physicians, but uh, time is of the essence, so I'm going to be short. Please forgive me. So first I want to introduce Dr. Allison Hall. She's an interventional cardiologist at Memorial University Hospital at St. John's in Newfoundland, Canada. Uh, we've listened to you over the years. Uh, she's written many uh, good things that we uh, all have read. Uh, uh, and uh, she's a CTO guru, and uh, so we'll look forward to hearing from her. Dr. Human Khalili is running a little late. My former colleague at the Dallas VA and UT Southwestern, I'll I'll hold off on introducing him until he gets here. Uh, Dr. Michael Luna. Uh, Mike is a, a, an awesome interventional cardiologist. Uh, he's a UT Southwestern faculty. He's actually UT Southwestern born and bred, 100% trained there from medical school all the way through his interventional program. Uh, uh, Mike is an uh, is awesome uh, teacher to our fellows, but uh, I particularly respect the fact that he devotes much of his time to the underprivileged uh, people at uh, Dallas, uh, by working at Parkland Memorial Hospital, he brings to that population uh, the very best interventional cardiology on the planet. Thank you, Michael. Uh, and then there's Dr. Dimitri uh, uh, Karampaliotis. I hope I pronounced that correctly, uh, Dimitri. Uh, Dimitri is an interventional cardiologist. He's the CTO director and of the Advanced Coronary Therapeutic uh, Program at Gagnon C uh, Cardiovascular Institute in a Morristown, uh, New Jersey. And uh, so, and then of course my, uh, my fellow uh, moderator here, uh, Mauricio Cohen, he's a professor of medicine at the University of Miami School of Medicine. He's the director of the cardiac cath lab there. Uh, he has more than 200 publications. Uh, 
of note, he was a member of the 2021 ACC American Heart Association and Sky Revask Guideline Writing Committee, a very important committee. It does very important work. Thank you, Mauricio. So uh, we'll begin today. I'm going to turn it over to uh, Mauricio to introduce the first uh, presenter. Okay, so the first presenter um, today is going to talk about a case with ultra low contrast rod assisted impella support complex PCI. The presenter is Abdul Oseni. Um, he is a fellow at the University of Oklahoma. Thank you so much. Good morning. Um, I'm Abdul. Um, I just completed my interventional fellowship at the University of Oklahoma and moving to Louisville, Kentucky for, uh, at Norton Health. Um, I'm going to be talking about a case we did a couple of months ago, ultra-low contrast PCI, um, rota assisted impeller supported. Um, I have no disclosures, but I want some. Um, the case is a 74-year-old male with a history of coronary disease with uh, DES to LED and OM in 2011, hypertension, hyperlipidemia, half ref EF 20 to 35, 25 to 30% uh, in February. He has CKD with a baseline creatinine of 1.4 initially, but has worsened down to 2.0. Um, he has PAD with AAA left common iliac artery aneurysm extending into the left external iliac artery, had an EVAR done. Uh, can I see my slides, please, here? <coughs> um, had an EVAR done in 2016. He also has a pacemaker in place, and. Uh, 40 pack year history of smoking. Um, he presented to the VA Medical Center with uh, NSTEMI and acute decompensated heart failure, had been admitted multiple times. In fact, uh, he was being admitted every two weeks for acute decompensated heart failure and NSTEMI. Um, a diagnostic angiogram was done, showed left main LED uh, disease as well as uh, some circumflex disease, and uh, he was referred for surgery and was turned down due to prohibitive risk. Um, these are the angiograms obtained at the VA Medical Center. I say the first one is not very clear, but uh, uh, they did an IFR of the left main into LED that was uh, 0 0.73, and uh, angiographically, the proximal left circumflex was uh, about 60%. There's also some OM disease previously been stented, but this is a kicker. This patient had a previous EVER and had this anatomy. Uh, this is the echo, um, low EF, and so the salient issues here were multi-vessel coronary disease with involving left main with uh, osteal and proximal circ, severe LV dysfunction, prohibitive iliofemoral anatomy for access, and chronic kidney disease with a creatinine now of 2.0. So the patient was transferred to us, and the plan was to obtain axillary access, use ultra-low contrast, uh, minimal contrast to do this procedure, do an axillary impeller, single access, and uh, get the procedure done. Unfortunately, when we got radial access, um, he had uh, a diseased radial artery, and uh, if you see here, it looks like an early bifurcation, bifurcating axillary artery, and uh, the actual smaller, the lower branch, the smaller one was where the radial artery was going into. Um, we put in a wire. The plan was to put in a wire. I used that as a bailout strategy just in case anything happens to the access uh, so that we can balloon and uh, tampon at it. But unfortunately, we were unable to do that. So we had to get our left femoral artery access to go up and put a wire in there to, uh, for a bailout strategy before getting access. The wire has to be there for axillary access so that um, in case anything happens, you can fix. So we got uh, access the standard fashion in the second to third portion of the axillary artery, making sure that we're not, in the, uh, we're not hitting the thoracic cage at all. And, um, we, and when we put the impeller sheet in, we noticed this. Um, the, there was no flow to the arm at all after the impeller was put in. So what, at this point, we contemplated many options. What we decided to do was to peel um, the impeller sheet and put in the leave-in sheath uh, that comes with the impeller. And after doing that, we still had minimal flow. And so at this point, we decided to do an external bypass from the left femoral artery into the radial artery where we had a 4-5 slender, um, which helped us because we anticipated that this was going to be a long procedure. Um, we didn't want um, upper extremity ischemia. So this is not actually the picture of what we did. I forgot to take a picture of it on the table. I didn't know I was going to present it. Um, but this is uh, the concept. 
Um, so we then put in the impeller through the axillary artery and engaged the, we got access in the right femoral artery and engaged the coronary, uh, the left main without puffing. Um, this we do routinely for ultra low contrast PCI. We confirm placement with either um, wire in the coronary or uh, as in this case, we injected saline and look for ECG changes on telemetry. Then we did um, IVOS of the LAD um, all the way uh, back to the left main, and uh, that showed moderate calcification. We anticipated it was going to be severe calcification, but since we saw moderate calcification, we abandoned the plan to rotate the LAD. Um, so we ballooned. Um, we actually wired the diag um, uh, to protect it, and then ballooned the mid LAD and stented the mid LAD. Um, this is acting up. Are you able to advance to the next slide, please? Oh, back. Back one, please. Okay, so um, this is a, uh, we then IVOSed the left circumflex artery and We then I was the left second flex artery and it showed severe calcification, um, three quadrant calcification, and uh, we went ahead and did a rotational atherectomy of the proximal <coughs> left second flex artery. And then uh, at this point, we took the very first picture uh, just to make sure that there was no perforation or any dissection. Um, uh, patient was stable at this time, no ECG changes and not complaining of chest pain. Then um, we then went ahead and ballooned uh, the left main into the LED as well as uh, the uh, left circumflex and did um, mini crush technique, uh, deploying two stents there. Then we did a completion, a completion angio at the end, which had good result. Actually, before this, we, actually, we did um, IVOS to confirm, uh, to make sure that the stents were well opposed and uh, well expanded, which it was. And we noticed that the osteal diag is a little pinched, but there's timothy flow. We um, decided to just walk away from this. Um, so at the end, we took out the impeller and deployed the perclose sutures and took an angiogram of the axillary artery. If you see where the red circle is, um, there's some extravasation of dye there. So we went up with a, um, a 6 uh, oh by 40 peripheral balloon and inflated it for four minutes, and this was the angio we did after that, and the uh, extravasation was gone. Um, the hospital course, patient had a right pectoral hematoma, likely due to bleeding around the repositioning sheath since we took out the bigger sheath uh, during the procedure. There was no evidence of active bleed. We did serial um, CT scans uh, and vascular ultrasound. They actually consulted vascular surgery, and the, there was nothing to do. The CT, serial CT scans just said it's stable hematoma. Um, Creatinine bumped up to 3.1 on day three, about at discharge on day four, it was 2.1. Um, discharged four days post P PCI, and since then he has not had recurrent uh, admissions. Um, special thanks to Osman Barber and Bo Hawkins, and I'll take questions at this time. We have time to discuss uh, or to, for a couple of questions, sir. Absolutely. Okay. Uh, Okay. Um, can you comment a bit on your decision tree in terms of deciding that this needed to be a supported PCI versus not? Yeah, so um, this patient had a low EF of, uh, 20, 20, uh, of 25 percent, had recurrent admission. Um, he's a vasculopath. Um, he was getting admitted every three weeks. Yeah, there was some pulmonary congestion by the time we took the patient to the table, and he was actually a little bit difficult to diurese at the outside hospital. So we felt um, uh, with this kind of case, um, we typically want to support the patient, especially if, if it's a left main lesion with proximal LED involvement and anticipated rotational arthritis. Not all left mains need to be supported. Um, did you do a right heart cath? No, not before this. Okay. And was the patient in the compensated heart failure? Was in this with the compensated heart failure when he was transferred to the hospital, but we diuresed the patient uh, for a day before we took and the patient to the table. And it seems the interventional part of the procedure was relatively simple. I mean, you resolved it quickly with one stent the two stents in the LAV and then just the rotoblader in the, in the surgery. Yeah. Uh, was, initially, we anticipated we were going to do a rotational atherectomy in the LAD. That's uh, part of the decision-making process. It was, was there any uh, dip in the hemodynamic status during the uh, left main? 
Uh, during the procedure, uh, patient did not decompensate, but when we were putting the impeller, he was transiently hypotensive. Um, looked like he has vagal responses to pain a lot. Can you uh, comment on your decision making uh, with respect to your uh, two stent strategy? How you decide mini crush versus DK, uh, DK crush? Yeah, so um, because um, uh, at this point the patient, uh, the, this procedure took a very long time before we got there, so it was a breach. At that point, um, uh, we did not want to go through the process, the full process of DK crush uh, versus mini crush at that time. And there's some, a lot of data coming out of New York, especially that um, they are having good outcomes with mini crush. Um, I know that. Uh, Left main bifurcation with DK crush is well studied, especially in the Japanese uh, cohort. But um, a lot of data is coming out that's showing that there's no big difference between mini crush and DK crush. That was an excellent case, um, uh, but I think that this case should always be done with right heart cath, not only to decide whether you're going to support the patient or not, but uh, when you're going to remove the device. We participate in the PROTECT4 trial, I'm part of the steering committee and uh, eligibility committee and so on and so forth. And one of the things that we've learned is that blood pressure and heart rate are very deceiving. So uh, uh, I strongly recommend that uh, when you do complex cases like this, put the, left heart, the right heart cath in, not so much to uh, guide you and help you whether you're gonna support or not, or it's really valuable, but when to remove um, the, the device. Noted, thanks. One last question, how yes. much contrast did, was the total amount? Um, the total amount of contrast was 80 cc's and that was due to the fact that we had issues with uh, ac um, access and having to uh, inflate balloons. But for the actual PCR, we used 10 cc's of contrast. Okay. Right. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the next uh, presenter is Stephen uh, Adudokun, and um, he's going to present a case on complex high-risk coronary intervention with orbital atherectomy. Um, he is currently a uh, PGY3 at White River and uh, is soon to be an interventional fellow and start his fellowship. So, Stephen? Okay, before I start, I just want to give a special thanks to my mentor, Dr. Anantha, for allowing me to be a part of this case. Our case begins with a 75-year-old female with a past medical history of heart failure with reduced hey, can ejection we see fraction. The slides on the, yeah, let us get this. Uh, on, on one second, I'm sorry for the interruption. In the panel, need to see the same screen yeah. as that screen there. In the, you had it right uh, a few minutes ago. Split. We're seeing the there, oh, there we, we are. are. Awesome. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Thank you. So, yeah, 75 year old that had a past medical history of heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. Her most recent echo, which was one month before she presented to her, our facility, she had an EF of 30 to 35 percent with severe anterior and anterolateral and infralateral wall motion abnormalities. She also had stage 3B CKD as well as paroxysmal non-valvular atrial fibrillation for which she was on Eliquis. She had a history of a, a known left main osteostenosis as well as severe disease of her left cirque and left anterior descending artery. At her baseline, she was an NYHA class three patient and she had severe dyspnea on even really basic things such as getting up to change the channel or even going to um, get up to go to her refrigerator. She had an elevated syntax score and she was evaluated by two separate CT surgeons at two different facilities for possible coronary artery bypass grafting. She was, however, denied by both due to her multiple cardiac comorbidities. In the past, a prior interventionalist had tried to intervene and two stents were placed, one in the left circ and one in the um, mid antero, left anterior descending artery, and both had poor expansion and uh, overall poor expansion. She presented to our facility with acute decompensated heart failure as well as a non-ST elevation myocardial infarction. So as a result, we took her to the cath lab. Here we have our initial iliac angiogram. 
For this case, we did not do a formal right heart cath. However, due to her overall presentation with decompensated heart failure, her elevated LVEDP, and her overall hemodynamics at the time of the cath, we went ahead and placed an impella CP for circulatory support during this procedure. Um, after our impella was placed, we went ahead to get our initial diagnostic angiogram. Can we see if we can play that one? Okay. As you can see, we have a pretty severe stenosis at the ostium of the left main, at least about 70%. There's an underexpanded stent in the proximal left circumflex that actually protrudes into the left main, as well as another stent in the mid LAD, which is also underexpanded. So after we did our diagnostic or initial angiogram, we proceeded with IVIS to get some more information about the vessels. I apologize that we don't have the actual IVIS imaging. However, we do have the results from the IVIS. Um, to get the IVIS, we did have some difficulties, especially wiring the LAD just due to the severity of the disease. So we had to do multiple balloonings with the NC balloon just to be able to pass a, <coughs> to pass a run through wire to get these measurements. So in the proximal portion of the LAD before the stent, we had a minimal lumen area of 2.6 millimeters per millimeter squared. And then on the mid to distal portion of the LAD, which was after the stent, we had a minimal lumen area of 2.1 millimeters squared. We then tried to wire the left circumflex, which was even more challenging, but after multiple balloonings and a Sion wire, we were able to wire that as well. And measurements within that left circumflex stent were 1.1 millimeters squared and below, so severely underexpanded. So after we proceeded with our IVIS, we then proceeded with our intervention. Um, this slide here was showing initially us doing our IVIS wiring. After we did IVIS, we proceeded with shockwave or IVL to the left circumflex. After that, we did orbital atherectomy to the um, LAD artery. We did orbital, we discussed possible rotational atherectomy too. However, at our facility, we just had orbital, so that's what we went with. We did the orbital atherectomy to the um, anterior and distal portions of the LAD, not the stented region itself. After we did um, orbital atherectomy to the LAD, we then placed a 3-0 stent there. Um, after that, we turned our attention to the left main lesion. For that lesion, we were kind of, let's see if I think the next slide, yeah. We were in between using the DK crush technique versus Coulot's technique. However, because of the fact that we had the left circumflex stent, which was already protruding into the left main, we went ahead and used uh, Coulot's technique just because we weren't sure about compression with the DK crush. Um, this is just a graphical representation of Coulot's technique. You place the wire through the stent, place the balloon to expand the struts, place the second stent through, and then use the crushing balloon technique for expansion. Here is our final angiogram. And as you can see, we have really good TIMI-3 flow at the left main. The left anterior descending also has good TIMI-3 flow. And that left circumflex has a big improvement in flow as well. Um, Post-procedure, she did extremely well. She stayed overnight for one day, was discharged home in the morning. She actually, we recently followed up with us in clinic and she's doing much better. She's now, well, let's go here. She's now NYHA class two and she's actually been able to walk to her mailbox and even take short walks with her dog. Here's just again our pre and post. And then lastly, just some take home points. Uh, severe left main disease. Um, that symptomatic always needs intervention, whether PCI or cabbage. In general, factors such as calcification, disease location, and user comfort dictate the techniques used. In this case, I thought it was really cool because we were able to use a combination of atherectomy, lithotripsy, <laughs> and advanced stenting to intervene on a lesion that, in this case, was even denied by um, multiple CT surgeons. And that's it. Any questions? Comments? Was there um, IVIS done post uh, intervention? We did not do it post intervention IVIS. I'm just curious how you know how that angiographically obviously it looks nice. Mm -hmm. but yeah, the, we did uh, not with the eyes or underexpanded stent. Yes, sir. Yeah. So, so did, the outcomes. Did you, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm just, one, one comment, the outcomes in left main intervention depends on the mm -hmm. minimal uh, stented area. So that's, uh, it's, it's a crucial, the question that was just made, it's crucial because uh, outcomes depend on that. 
and that's been shown in the Excel trial and the Noble trial. So it's important to see what our final result is with ultrasound. And also pre, you need to figure out what the mechanism of free stenosis is. Is it under expansion? Is it neotherosclerosis or what it is? So especially in left main standing, I think mm -hmm. that uh, IVUS is, uh, is, uh, is, is mandatory. Gotcha. Was the patient small? Okay. <clears throat> because those are the, the sizes of that Korean study that has that picture with the polygon of confluence. Korean people are I think a little bit, was I mean, BMI. no intention of any type of offense to Korean people, but they're a little bit smaller. So, and, and here in the U.S., maybe, I mean, the minimal stented area in the Excel trial was uh, at least 11 in the left main. Yeah, we, we've published this, those data, and in the left main, you need to have 10, and then the restenosis is really minimal in, in the U.S. population in the Excel trial. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much. Um, Thank you. So we're going to go with the third case. I think the reason that we used the IV intravascular lithotripsy on the left circumflex was mostly because I think it was just so underexpanded in just the intimal calcium. We were trying to get to that. I'm not sure if you can speak a little bit more to it, Dr. Neff. Okay, thank you so much. We need to move uh, fast. We have little time for the cases. So the next case is going to be presented by Manesh Narayanan uh, from University of Arkansas, and the title of the presentation is, I know it's emergent, but let's play ping pong and locate the right vessel. Good morning, everybody. Thank you for uh, this chance um, to present my case here, um, the CVA. And I'm Mahesh Ananta, one of the interventional cardiologists at the White River Medical Center and the faculty um, at the University of Arkansas Medical Center. Let's wait for my slides to be opened up here in a second. Um, Ananta, last name A N A N T H A. That's a different one. There, that's the one, yep. Oh, it says I'm a fellow now, so <laughs> still. Yeah, that should be the first upload on that. <laughs> yep, click on that. Then go to the first one. No, the first one. It says, no, no, the one above that. Yeah. Sorry, with all the technical glitches, I didn't. <laughs> there it is. That's that's a PowerPoint. It's uploaded up there. Oh. Yeah, I don't know. See there? It's yeah. It's it's right there. <laughs> I was thinking of using my own computer, but I didn't have this connection to. <laughs> Um, so I call it, I know it's emergent, but let's play ping pong and locate the right vessel because you'll get to see what I'm 
mentioning in the next few slides. Um, go to the next slide, please. So can I use the green button? Okay. Okay. Our patient is a 75-year-old presented with um, chest pain, pound to have non segment elevation, myocardial infarction, um, troponin went up to uh, 17 when he was presented to our hospital. A radial diagnostic angiogram showed absent left main, severe instant restenosis of a proximal LED stent, which I will show you in the next slide. That's his initial angiogram. As you can see, the left circumflex has a separate ostia, and the LED is faintly filling, and there is severe stenosis of the proximal LED, and the RCA looks actually normal in that. So it's very difficult to keep the LED artery engaged because of the separate ostium from the radial artery, and the patient had a lot of um, breathing difficulty and stuff, so it's difficult to keep it in position. We tried advancing a workhouse wire into prox LED, and once after I pushed the wire into that stenosis segment, the flow completely stopped in the LED, and the patient started experiencing chest pain and hypotension at this point. So we're gently advancing the wire into distal LED in an RAO view, and the wire went pretty smooth. And I couldn't confirm the wire position because there's no flow down the LED, but um, it felt smooth. We went through that, and um, I'll show you the picture that I got after this. And right after I did that, um, he dropped pressures more, and we gave him bolus of phenylephrine, and then we had a balloon dilatation of instant restenotic segment immediately and tried to attempt to pass IVIS to make sure it's the right vessel before we do anything. I was wouldn't cross that segment in the pros proximal to mid-segment of the wired vessel. And then we did a contrast injection that showed a type 3 perforation in the vessel, proximal to mid-segment with no flow downstream in the mid-vessel. And then I used a 2.5 millimeter balloon to balloon tamponade at this point. Patient is severely experiencing chest pain and hypotension. So I'll just play this video here just to show all the steps that we did. And right after that, big septal branch is where the leak seems like. And it's not documented well in this picture, but that's what it will on tamponading here. I just wouldn't pass, and that's where I stop. So at this point, I was just curious, trying to see if you would suggest any further step or anything else that you would do differently. We wired through that, and there's a leaking, and we are tamponading it. And we can confirm with IVIS. So that's me trying to attempt to pass, because this is all happening quick and patient is going down quick. I'm trying to get groin access, and we have a pericardial synthesis kit ready, and it's a big vessel. If it bleeds, it's, it's a problem, and now we have a uh, covered stent. I'm trying to pass. Nothing would advance past that. And again, even after the covered stent, there's no flow. It's not going to stay open. It's going to close off the entire vessel at this point. So we're just trying to struggle to f figure out what, what we should do. At this point, I felt like this was taking care of the leak at this point at least, and patient stabilized a little bit with levo drip, and then we started him on phenylephrine, and I tried getting a second axis from the groin, and we went uh, with a ping pong guide here, and second axis was obtained with EVU35. We used a second guide catheter, disengaged the first one a little bit with the wire and the, the balloon in that um, in, the, in the artery, and then we uh, engaged the second wire, trying to see if that's a dissection plane that we entered. Hopefully we can get it a true lumen, or even use a fielder or something to knuckle down to get in true lumen so we can achieve uh, flow and then start um, stenting at some point. But we could not confirm the position of the, the wire with IVA, so I'm trying to get into that vessel. Um, so also I thought the, the support was pretty poor from radial, just the, the, the catheter kept bumping out of the vessel, so I thought it would be more supported from the groin at this point. And also if you need support at this point, the big vessel down, like an, an impeller or something, then I thought it will get a groin access at this. And then something struck me. We were looking at deep RAO cranial view, and I'm like looking back at my pictures again and trying to see what that vessel could be. And I said, it's possibly there is a steep angulated vessel which appears like a big diagonal branch, which if I go back, you'll probably see. Um, that might be the LED vessel, which I wasn't sure, but it's a pretty big vessel. And that vessel, we took a little more RAO steep view, and we looked at the apex of the heart, and that felt like going more to the apex than this vessel that we're dealing with. So the second wire was advanced in the diagonal looking branch, and we confirmed this is the LED after we IVSed it with the vessel measurements and everything. So while tamponading now with the septal branch, balloon dilatation of LED um, was performed. We dilated the stent starts, and we dilated the mid LED as well. That's what I wanted to show you. So see, that diagonal branch that's cheating me just seems like it's, it's a diagonal, actually goes all the way to the apex. And things happen so quick that last track of everything, we felt that branch 
especially as it moved so smooth down the vessel, felt was the actual LED branch. But now I have a second wire passing through that LED. And I'll show you the steps. Um, here we trained a wire this. And that's a coward's and I just left it there because it's tamponading. Now I'm tamponading the septal branch, trying to dilate that LED branch. And you can see that wire, the other wire comes all the way to the apex and curves around the apex here. It's a type 3 LED. And now we establish flow in the LED, and I'm starting to work on fixing that while we're balloon tamponading this, this uh, branch here. Um, the septal branch was still showing a leak even after we performed all the stenting in the LED. Um, so I decided to deploy a coil. By this time, it was very helpful. One of my techs reached out and got pictures from another institution that was done, and we confirmed there was actually a septal branch um, and not the actual LED. And then the LED stenting was completed following that. So this is after we tried some fat harvest and injected some fat particles, it wouldn't stop. So I decided to coil that branch. And then we're fixing the LED here all the way into the ostium because there's no left main. That should be my last. Um, so you see the apex, the vessel going down all the way down there. And that's our, I think our final result here with that. Um, so prior angiogram pictures were obtained from another institution after it got down to the case and um, seems like a small septal branch at that point. And seems to be one of the unique situations where the LED vessel couldn't be visualized right after we wired that vessel. And I was mistaken that this branch that is coming to in the RAO view seems like the apical vessel, but it's not. And I have seen two or three of these cases where the diagonal actually seems like it's taken off at an acute angle, even for a CTO we're trying to do, but actually turns out to be the one that goes to the apex. Uh, mistake, we always get pictures from prior institution before you go ahead and catch somebody. That's what we learned after that case. And ping pong comes in handy to support advancing covered stents in unique situation like this case where there was no support. Uh, trying to tamper out until at this point, we can get this LED flow open and stabilize the patient at that point. I did not have to do an impella on this guy. Um, he stabilized his EF right after that procedure was normal, and um, um, he did not have any effusion or anything at all. And he did not have any VST the following day we repeated an uh, ultrasound. So thank you. So you, you coil the septal? Yes, there was a lot of leak that I was not able to control with fat particle injection, and um, we tried balloon tamponing for a long time. It was still leaking, Frank uh, Burr for the end. More, more, most of the time, these are of no clinical right. consequences. Right. I mean, there have been a couple of studies. Uh, Carl published a, a horrible case a few years ago in Jack Interventions, and then we published another one, a dry tamponade from the RCA that we had to put uh, in Perla in to, to bypass it because it was uh, uh, <coughs> compromising the chamber from within. But 99.9% .9 of the time, you really don't need to do anything about this. Right, exactly. So I felt that another question I was having while doing this case was, is it like a dual LED physiology? Is it a big vessel that's still leaking? I haven't had the picture at that time. They told me, and I didn't look at it myself. So I was trying to deal with this. So I wasn't sure if it's going to stop or not. But it was still leaking after a quite a bit of balloon tamponade. I didn't really want to reverse that with all this LED disease and things are going the wrong direction with the new stents that we had. But it's a pretty um, a short period of time, I could decide. But um, we injected fat particle from his groin. It was, um, um, was unsuccessful. And finally, we ended up deciding that uh, throw a two millimeter coil in there. Yeah, yeah. so it's difficult to judge without seeing the angiogram and, and, and looking at the, the injury. Right. Uh, but it, it looks like a bifid LED system. Right, right, right. And um, what Dimitri is, is describing is more septal hematoma. Yes, what yes, you're yeah. describing is yes, just a, a connection. Perfect. Yeah. And usually when you injure these septal branches, right. the, the shunt isn't. Right. Uh, isn't, or the, the injury isn't to the pericardium. It's right. usually it's intracardiac. In yes, and yes, so yeah. you just create a shunt, basically. Right, exactly. And yeah. typically that, that's we'll of no consequence. So that's probably what you were seeing. Right, right, right. Yep. Yeah, and also like with the septal branch, the wire perf with the microcatheter for CTOs, we do all the time, and there's a septal perf and it stops on its own. But I really tried getting a balloon down there and pushed an IVIS and damage to the vessel from whatever small damage, but wire perf is different from what I created by using all this equipment. So I was a little 
skeptical of leaving that alone. And you have, at some point, you have the, the covered stent down there, the stent graft? So it's a covered stent, yes. The covered um, stent, so, yeah. but you never deployed it? I never deployed it. I was, I was not sure there's no flow, it's gonna shut down at some point. I was like, there's no outflow and it's probably not gonna stay open and I, I was just debating between doing that or not, but it just kept the vessel from bleeding, so I didn't deploy that covered stent at all. I just took it out and wasted a covered stent. <laughs> okay, I think we're ready for the next All case. right, thank you so much again for this chance. Thank you so much. So the next case is um, an acute left main occlusion during diagnostic coronary angiogram, uh, presented by Dr. Christopher Foth. He is from Palmetto General Hospital, down the road from us in, in, in Miami. Yep. Hi, everyone. Thank you. My case is going to be a lot simpler compared to this last one. So. Hopefully we'll find the slides. <laughs> <laughs> I did bring my flash drive just in case. Hmm. Uh, Foth, F-O-T-H. Guys, can you do that uh, when we are doing the discussion? Can you can we look for the for the next presentation when we're doing the discussion of this? Okay. 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 Thank you. Just asking. So good morning, thank you for having me. Uh, is there a way to control slides from here or do I have to advance it? Oh, there we go. All right, so, uh, so this is just the initial presentation of this patient just because this is not, this is one of those patients that you're kind of doing the cast to not really expecting to find too much. Um, so he presented from outpatient rehabilitation center due to respiratory distress. Um, gurgling, struggling to breathe in the emergency department. However, when he came into emergency department, he did go into V-fib and was shocked back into his normal ventricular pace rhythm. This is a patient with a leadless pacemaker in the right uh, ventricle. And then he was given amiodarone in the emergency department. He's pretty hemodynamically stable. His lactic acid was elevated, white blood cell count elevated. Um, his troponin was just barely negative in the emergency department. Um, does also have a history of atrial fibrillation. Um, so they intubated him in the emergency department, started propofol, uh, became a little hypotensive and was fine on low-dose norepi. Uh, they continued the amiodarone drip for the protocol. We got a few VP troponins that were positive, but not, you know, majorly positive and did trend down at the end. Uh, the echo came back, EF 3035, multiple warm motion abnormalities. Day two, they extubated him, titrated him off the norepi, put him on oral amio. He was doing fine, uh, discussed with the family, you know, whether or not they want him to, you know, continue with aggressive care or not. Um, and they opted for the cardiac cath. And he had a very tortuous uh, 
right and nominate and subclavian. So this is a JR from the right radial. You can see some collaterals um, coming in late there. And then we switch to the left, and it doesn't really show on here, but it looks like there's a thrombus occluding the little area that was not, that was actually blood was going through, and then there's a plaque like on the bottom. Um, so, and this is with an EBU5 French um, from the radial. Uh, option here was to try and wire this and open it um, from the radial, but we opted for um, Impella because the patient immediately after shooting this went from an invasive blood pressure of like 150 over 70 to basically like nothing, like 40 over non-detectable. Um, and then shortly after that, he went to ventricular fibrillation again. Um, we shocked him back into his pace rhythm, and then we decided to place an impella instead of struggling with the uh, right radial access. Uh, we placed it left femoral. Um, we did by palpation because we were in a, hut, in a rush. Uh, and then we used single access through the impella sheath at 10 o'clock for the PCI. Uh, so we were very easily able to advance the whisper wire um, into any diagonal artery that we can get. Um, and then we ballooned it with a 2 5 by 12. Um, and it all expanded pretty well. And you'll see we get flow back pretty easily here. It's calcified, um, but it wasn't really impeding us. Um, then we took the whisper wire back and put it back in the first diag and put a choice PT in the LAD and further ballooned that with a 3 by 20. A little bit better flow. Um, so at this point, we decided to go with primary stenting um, or go with stenting before imaging. Um, in the mid LAD, we put a 275 by 38, and then from the Fox LED back into the left main, we put a 4 by 26. Um, then we did IVIS, and sadly, our IVIS machine is terrible for getting images from, so I don't have it. Um, but these are all appropriate sized uh, balloons to what we found on IVIS. And the calcium was not circumferential, and it didn't really impede uh, placement of any of, or expansion of the scent with these balloons. So he, in the LED, got a 4 by 15, the proximal portion of the LED got a 4 5, and in the left main to 5 0. And then this is what it looks like after. And if you guys notice, there's a vessel missing here. So the circumflex is just completely occluded here. Um, we put a wire down it, went down it pretty easily, um, and then we we're going to try and balloon, but it was just completely filled with thrombus. Um, and at this point, he was hemodynamically stable <coughs> back to his baseline. So uh, we decided to just go with medical therapy and then do a relook angio in the next you know, few days if the family wanted it. Um, family actually decided <laughs> against any further uh, you know, invasive procedures. Um, and he actually did very well. Um, again, he was a little hypotensive, but that was on the uh, propofol that he was on you know, before he was hypotensive with propofol, and he was hypotensive with it again. Um, and then just low dose norepi for the next week, and he was discharged off all pressures, and he hemodynamically stable. Um, so that's the end of it. Okay, thank you so much. <laughs> nice case, it's a scary situation. Yeah. I have an issue there. So I see that the, the, the catheters are going up through the groin. You said radial axis, but then I so see we, we a very- So we switched to impella. No, no, not oh. impella. The, the case is a diagnostic case is where you show that the left main was completely occluded. Mm -hmm. uh, you show uh, a, a very aggressive uh, go back very aggressive um, uh, engagement. So that's, that's, to me, that looks like femoral. It doesn't look like the radial is anywhere around or the subclavian. So, so yeah. <laughs> so, so, and I it think seems this is a... the, at, and the catheter is pointing up towards the, towards the roof of the left main, and that's probably what dissected the left main. And that seems to be a guide. And here, here you know, this catheter is also okay. femoral, right? When no, you we, we definitely the... did it from the radial. Mm -hmm. We definitely did this case on the radio. Well, I see something going up in the I, I don't know yeah. what that is, but that's definitely not the catheter. 
Okay. <laughs> okay, know. and then you use a, a, an EVU because the other catheter is very aggressively pointing towards the roof of yeah. the left main, and that's probably what caused the, the okay. dissection. So do you think when you, when you were able to get uh, through, the, through the lumen of the LAD, do you think mm -hmm. about also looking for the CERC um, at that time? In the beginning of it? Yeah, when you, well, you, you, you know, you were kind of relieved. You put the impella, then you went back with a different guy, that, mm -hmm. I mean, which are, you know, this is a usual teaching when you have a, an osteo dissection. Uh, you have to use a different curve, so, because uh, if you keep doing the same thing, you're going to be, yeah. you know, continue to do the same mistake and, and going in the same false lumen. So, so I know this is a ADU different again. guide shape, but uh, now you got into a lumen, which seems to be the LAD. Did you look there for, or did you try to uh, identify the circ and, and go no, throw one on the circ? Just went to the LAD. Yeah. Any uh, comments from the? What, uh, what, what did the EKG show on presentation? In the emergency the, yeah. department, it was just his pace, like RV pace rhythm at 16. And then he went to the VFAB. <clears throat> yeah, it's an interesting question about the EKG. I guess with pace rhythm, it's difficult to interpret it for ischemia, but you had one initial troponin that was negative. Um, mm -hmm. Just looking at his original presentation was a VF arrest as well, so just yeah. maybe you could discuss the timing of cath versus, you know, immediate yeah. cath versus the delayed decision on that. Did you, did, sorry, did, did, did I guess when he it? came in and presented, he had had a VF arrest. Yes. I guess his lactate was up and he had a Oh, so your question was if we wanted to immediately have Yeah, I just. So he um, was a patient that came from um, a local rehab, and the family initially didn't want anything aggressive when he came in, so that's why it was about five days before they were like, all right, we'll go ahead with the cast. Okay. Um, he did have <clears> no <throat> further arrhythmias in those five days. Yeah, and it is an issue of debate as well. I mean, there's evidence that you can wait, you know, if they don't have ST elevation, et cetera. Just where you had the pace rhythm, I figured we'd bring it up. So. Yeah. Thanks. Okay, well, thanks so much. Um, yeah. We're going to move on. Um, our next presentation is by uh, Dr. Priya Bensal. You're not here. Okay, we go. We'll move on. Um, yeah. So let's uh, then talk. We'll have uh, Dr. Das, Debraj Das, is here. A big balloon problem. Boy, we have a lot of no-shows today. Not cool. Move forward. Yeah. Perforation battle by Dr. Albaguri. He's the one who. Uh, oh, was another <coughs> show, right? Yeah, he's the one who wasn't going to show. Go yeah, career. Dr. Albaguri had visa issues. He can't. He was. He's coming from Egypt, so he will not be presenting. So we are going to the 9.40 a.m. We're really going to get done early. Yeah, we we're, we're, we're so much ahead of time. <laughs> we were worried about being late. <laughs> we're, amazing moder we're amazing moderators. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and then so we'll go to uh, perforation, uh, primary PCI in the lateral decubitus, first reported case wow. by Dr. Elbore. Uh, Dr. Albore comes to us uh, from Egypt, from yes. Cairo. Yes, yes. So welcome. Thank you. We look forward to hearing your case.
Ya. Yeah. Okay, good morning everyone. First, I have no conflict of interest to declare. And just to be prepared, this case doesn't entail any complex BCI technique uh, just presented by my colleagues, but only it contains an ovule idea. Okay. Our patient is a 72-year-old lady known to be diabetic and hypertensive, presenting to us with chest pain for a 12-hour duration. Her ECG revealed anterior stemming. Importantly, this patient had a lumbar disc problem causing severe agonizing pain on lying flat. Patient was transferred to cath lab for primary PCI, where we faced the challenge that the patient couldn't lie supine at all. So after trying uh, analgesia, sedation uh, doesn't work, we left with either uh, undergo PCI under general anesthesia with potential risk on patient borderline hemodynamics or just acclimatize with a patient right lateral decubitus and proceed for primary BCI in this uh, new position, and this was uh, our choice. So is our patient lying in her uh, right lateral side, and we opted for a left radial axis? And this our uh, right cranial view, showing proximal and mid LED tandem significant lesion, but actually this is not the right cranial view we uh, are dealing with every day. And this was a picture from right codal view. So what is different in this novel position? Actually, the classic angiographic views were shifted 90 degree to the right side, so that the right cranial view gave a left cranial one, right codal view gave a left codal one, and we can obtain AB view from, uh, and the AB view will give a lateral one. So back to our patient after pre-dilatation of the lesion, a couple of stent were uh, deployed, followed by post-dilatation, and this was the final result. The patient was transferred to CCU and discharged a couple of days later after optimization of anti-ischemic and anti-failure treatment. So four decades left with no other options, the patient have to lie supine for the whole coronary angiography or PCI procedure regardless of the access site. Nevertheless, patient preference have, has never been questioned before. So this might be annoying to some patient to lie uh, on their back for a long time, especially in long procedure like CTOs. So hence all views in this novel position are reversed. A high radiation exposure views as lateral view could be obtained from a neutral less uh, radiation one, AB1. So this new position also opened the horizon for future research about the possible improvement of uh, patient experience during the BCI and patient reported outcome and potential uh, radiation reduction. And remember that every milestone in cardiac catheterization started with a simple idea. Thank you. So nice, short, and, and, and sweet. Uh, thank you so much for sharing um, this uh, case. I would like to see if anybody in the panel has any questions or any comments. Yeah, very interesting uh, solution uh, to that problem. What uh, bailout plan did you have should he have hemodynamic compromise? Uh, did you, 
Should the patient have had yeah, hemodynamic compromise the, the, during the intervention? Actually, the patient uh, 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 rapid lock of echo during transfer to cath lab, hair function about 25%, hair blood pressure about 90 over 60. So uh, with the induction of any uh, form of anesthesia, uh, actually we have uh, uh, previous uh, cases of uh, collapse just during induction of anesthesia of, uh, with uh, such patient profile. So we opted to take the, the, the other option. Did you have a plan in place in case the patient collapsed? Yes, right? so we, we have uh, uh, in our cath lab uh, the, the form of uh, mechanical support available in Egypt is still only intraortic balloon. Mm -hmm. It was in, in, in the cath lab at that time, and we are uh, uh, kept here at a, as a backup plan if something uh, went wrong. Were, were the groins prepped? Were the groins, the femoral arteries, were they prepped? Yes, when, uh, this routine, yes. Okay, uh, in this case also with uh, in lateral decubitum? Uh, uh, only uh, sterilizing the, okay. the, the groin, but uh, not, not trying them in. I, I tried the, 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 the one uh, axis that is close to me, which was the left radial in this uh, case. Yeah, I know that some people have tried um, doing like in the dentist, like in a, in a chair like an articulated chair, uh, I know that that's been, I think that's been done before uh, with an angiogram. I think radial allows you to, to, you know, the flexibility to place a patient in yes. different positions. Um, any other, any additional comments, Dimitri? Uh, the only comment I have to make is that uh, when people uh, are not in the supine position, you have to be very knowledgeable about the angiographic views and uh, make sure that you, what you see is what it is. And they did a pretty good job there. They were able to define the anatomy because I've seen cases where the patients move a little bit, they're a little bit up, a little bit down, and uh, catastrophes occur because people cannot figure out what vessel they're intervening on. But here it was done perfectly. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so okay, much. Yeah. Okay, so, um, I mean, we have a, the big balloon problem. Is the presenter for the big balloon problem here now? Okay, you were late. Yeah, that's fine. That's fine. We still <laughs> like you. We still like you. <laughs> so, thank you so much for coming and presenting. So, this is uh, Dr. Debraj Das. He's going to present the big balloon problem at his institution is um, Alexander, uh, Royal Alexander Hospital from Edmonton in Alberta. Canada. Perfect. Uh, thank you for having me. So my name is Debraj Das. I'm uh, one of the new interventional uh, cardiologists at the Royal Alex Hospital in Edmonton, Canada. And I have a pretty interesting uh, complication that uh, I was uh, hoping to present and hopefully you guys can uh, take something away from this. So the story starts with a 45-year-old Caucasian gentleman. He has a known history of an ischemic cardiomyopathy, LV systolic dysfunction, EF of about 28%. He's an active smoker. He has a history of sleep <coughs> apnea, gout, and depression, and a long-standing history of medi uh, medication noncompliance and in and out of hospital. He had an angiogram that was done in 2018 by a colleague of mine, which showed severe three-vessel disease uh, with a complete occlusion of the circumflex. And I'll show you guys the actual angio after, but that's kind of the... Um, just kind of the preliminary carrot uh, kind of diagram that we had. And then he had an MRI done after this angiogram which showed a severely dilated um, LV, established infarct in the circumflex territory, but the LAD and right coronary territory was still viable. And so the recommendation from the cardiologist reading the uh, MRI was that PCI to the LAD and right coronary was a good option. Now I apologize because the uh, CINE images, oh, uh, the CINE images uh, have our stamps on them. Can I just go back? Uh, this should play automatically. Um, it should, uh, there should be a way to, play. it was playing on the, can we? So there's a little notice up, up there that says, uh, sorry, we can't play the meat in this presentation. And then there's a link. How I can, can I play this? Uh, that's, yeah, I was in the speaker ready room where I was working. Maybe maybe it's uh, one of those that open just as, go back uh, read only or something. I mean, no, they, it was they, it was just an API file. That's a shame. If you exit, okay. 
if we just go to, if we just come out of the PowerPoint, can we just play it? Uh, and if you just bring it down. Uh, no, just pray, see that hyperlink or download it to the computer, download it locally, maybe. Download we, it locally. Yeah, are we able to just put it onto the desktop for you guys and then play it? Just yeah, from, just download it. Because it, it should be working. No, 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 no. Jeez. Thank you. Uh, if you just maybe click and then once you open that. Uh, I mean, there's a download that link there. Uh, there we go. Yeah, perfect. Thank you. And now you. you can open it from the, instead of the online PowerPoint, you open from the, perfect. there we go. There we go. And then if we go there. Presentation. And then, yes, and it should, so just if we press play. Beautiful. There we go. Okay. Oh, oh. So uh, the right coronary artery here, uh, you can see this is the 2018 angiogram, diffusely diseased, and you can see kind of in the top right, I didn't have another picture, but you can see that there's parts of the circumflex starting to fill. So no doubt there that it's a diseased artery. Uh, caudal view here on the left, we can see that the circumflex is completely occluded, and then the cranial view of the LED, diffusely diseased. So with the MRI results, this angiogram, the decision was made to proceed with PCI, of the uh, right coronary and the LAD. Again, uh, the LV angio here confirming severe LV systolic dysfunction. So before that, of course, our patient left against medical advice. He wasn't interested in PCI at the time. And then over the next three years, he was in and out of hospital with decompensated heart failure. He was medically optimized and then um, was just uh, uh, left for you know, ongoing antiplatelet and LV enhancement treatment. I met this gentleman in March of this year when at this point he had made some changes in his life and was willing to undergo PCI. So using the 2018 angiogram as my roadmap, um, I went ahead with planned intervention <coughs> at the right corner in the LAD. So I started with a six French AL 0.75 guide, right radial, uh, workhorse BMU2 wire. Uh, IVUS guidance up front and confirmed it to be about a five millimeter vessel throughout the entirety of the right coronary artery. I went ahead and inserted four overlapping drug-eluting stents, pretty much from the distal right coronary all the way back to the RCA ostium, and then aggressively post-dilated with a 515 NC trek balloon between 24 to 26 atmospheres. And then after the final post-dilatation, pretty much right at the RCA ostium, the 50 NC balloon would not deflate. And that was really what I was looking like at the time. And this is kind of the situation I was in. So I pulled the balloon back out of the coronary, um, but this is a 5.0 balloon now at 26 atmospheres. I still have my BMU wire through the balloon, six French AL guide, and I cannot get this balloon out. So I just wanted to maybe stop for a second just to see if anybody had thoughts about um, how I could get this balloon back out of this patient's body. So some people have done the back of the, the back sharp end of the, of, a, of the coronary wire and tried to burst that balloon. Okay. Back to the balloon. I mean, here is, we have a, a few masters here on, on chip and CTO. Is that, that would be the first thing you guys would try? So. That or electrocodify it also. Okay. We don't have electrocautery in our lab, but that is exactly the first thing I tried is I first of all tried to inflate it even further to see if I could rupture it, but it was an NC balloon, so it didn't work. I tried a Gaia third, a Confianza Pro, a Hornet 14, the back end of a workhorse uh, wire, and then the back end of the Argon J wire as well. Now, it was interesting because every single time the wire hit the balloon, it would just slip into the aorta, and so I, there was no way I could actually, you know, provide enough pressure to actually puncture this NC balloon. So, so, so the balloon now is outside the coronary? Or the is balloon is in the aorta. Is in the aorta. Yep, okay. and I still have the workhorse wire through it. Now, in the exchange of all of these wires, uh, my fellow that I was working with inadvertently actually pulled the coronary wire out now too. So the next uh, bit here, I have lost actually the wire through the balloon, so I just have the guide and the balloon together. So, so, so what do you think is the mechanism that uh, you could not deflate the balloon? Do you think you had a one-way valve? Maybe you were a little bit inside the guy. Do you think it was a hypotube issue? 
I, in, in retrospect, thinking, I think I, I started pulling the balloon before it was completely deflated and strangulated it. So you had a one-way valve, essentially. That, exactly. That's exactly right. So I could, I could inflate it, but not deflate it in any capacity. And you could not rupture it? And I could not rupture it. And uh, it's a 5-0 five, five oh balloon. Did you try changing the Yes, I changed the inflator. absolutely. How about two six, six French guide. How about two inflators? It's a it's a relatively bigger guy. Uh, you know, I didn't look specifically at the accelerator, but he is a bigger gentleman. That's that's exactly the that was exactly the only. So I was in a desperation mode at this point. I really didn't know what to do. Um, I've never I've had this complication as a fellow with smaller balloons, which you can kind of capture it. But in this case, that's exactly what I tried to do. So I pulled it so, at least in the worst case scenario, if it was stuck in the arm, I could call vascular surgery. And I had lost my coronary wire at this time, too. Did, did you try a Y connection with two inflators? Uh, I didn't try that, no. That's something that you could do. Take, and, take uh, and, two I, and I can guarantee you that it will rupture. Yeah. Yeah, but the okay. problem is that when we rupture it, I mean, you have then the, all the all the flakes of that balloon may may prevent you from getting it back into the guy. I mean, no, but it was outside the coronary. No, yeah, no, it was correct. outside the coronary. It was in the aorta. Yeah, it wasn't but, the worst. I mean, the, the, so the, I was the, able the disaster to, uh, is if you have it in the coronary tree, and, and then, then you, you cannot uh, uh, deflate it. But if it's in the aorta, then you're a little bit more. Flexible, so so I, I was able to bring it into the forearm, and this is kind of the area where it got stuck in the forearm. So that's me trying to keep uh, to keep pulling it, and then um, we had lost the guide wire, and so I was able to retract it into the forearm. And then the next thing I tried to do was exactly that: is uh, use uh, floral guided with a femoral um, uh, puncture needle. And you can see in the right that uh, after the puncture, there's contrast that uh, yes. gets deflated out. Very cool. And then I was able to slowly then, very gratefully, uh, able to retract the mm. balloon. So then I went back, uh, just to take a final picture, we had post dilated the right coronary already. And just to ensure that there was nothing that was bleeding in the radial, I took a seven French XB guide to do the LED, uh, just so that a slightly bigger guide might uh, tampon out any bleed. And then this is kind of what the radial looked like, so there was no extravasation. He was a little bit tender from our, our uh, puncture site, but otherwise okay, was okay, and then I monitored him for the next several hours. So a strangulated balloon uh, during PCI remains a rare and serious complication. There are uh, actually not that many reports out of this uh, kind of transradial puncture, but the mechanisms, at least in the few case reports I had seen, uh, describe recoil of a severely calcified lesion causing compression of the balloon entry port, strangulation of the proximal end if you pull the balloon back too quickly, which is, I think, the case in, in mine, and then damage to the balloon hypotube if you use it as a trap balloon and then try to insert it um, afterwards to use as well. So this method of transcutaneous puncture, uh, again, has been only described in case reports. It's a nice and effective way to uh, remove the balloon without having to get a second access site. Um, and particularly with a 5.0, uh, you know, large caliber balloon, it was quite effective. And this gentleman uh, was, you know, he was good enough to follow up with us about six weeks later, but then hasn't, we haven't seen him since, unfortunately. But with that, uh, thank you guys for allowing me to present. Thank you. Do you really have a clinic called Stabilization Clinic? Yeah, we do. Yeah, it's just it's for specifically okay. for patients who have LV systolic dysfunction. We have a few nurse practitioners that uh, follow them quite closely. That's very all. interesting. Okay. Yeah. All right. But the, but then you would have to use a six French guideliner. And, and then a 5-0 balloon wouldn't pick. Because I, I honestly didn't really know. I was thinking even if you went eight French through the leg, snared it, it still wouldn't come through, right? So uh, that's what makes it a bit of a tricky situation, yeah. All right, thank you. Excellent, thank you. So the, the last, um, at least, I hope it's the last, uh, it's multi-vessel disease in STEMI by Dr. Ahmed Kamal. 
Ahmed is uh, from Qasr al Ain Hospital in Cairo, Egypt. Thank you and welcome. Good morning. I am Dr. Ahmed Kamel, lecturer of cardiology, Qasr al Hospital, Cairo University. I'm glad today to present my case, multivessel disease in STEM. Our clinical data is a 60-year-old female patient, diabetic on oral hypoglycemic drugs, not hypertensive. She was presented with infraposterior STEMI of three hours duration. She was in agony. Her pulse was 80 beats per minute, regular. Blood pressure 120 over 80. Normal jugular venous pressure with normal waveform. Chest, abdominal, and cardiac examination was unremarkable. Here is the diagnostic coronary angiogram. As we can see here, there is an osteal LCX subtotal occlusion. Also, there was an osteal and mid LED significant stenosis. The RCA was normal. It was difficult engagement. Here we have uh, three different decisions. Will we do a PCI to osteal uh, LCX, which was the carpet vessel here? or we do complete revascularization with PCI, or we send the patient to cabbage. Our plan was to adopt PCI strategy. We choose an EPU 3.56 French guiding catheter and BM wire as a workhorse. First of all, we have done pre-dilatation to LCX osteal lesion by 2.5 times 20 millimeter PTCA balloon. You can see improvement in the lesion. Then after this, what we'll do? Will we continue or send the patient to cabbage? Here we adopt the continue. We start pre dilatation of the middle AD by 2.75 times 20 millimeter NC balloon, followed by three times 20 millimeter NC balloon. Finally, the balloon was properly inflated and the lesion improved. Then we do stenting of the middle AD by three times 33 millimeter drug eluting stent with a good result. Then we have the osteal LCX lesion with the osteal LED lesion, and we have here a Medina classification 011 with the left main LED and LCX almost same diameter, so we choose to do a Kilot technique for this bifurcation. First of all, do stenting of the left main LCX by 3.5 times 20 millimeter drug eluting stent. And then we have rewiring and opening the stent struts to LED by 2.5 times 20 millimeter balloon. And then stenting of the left main LED by 3.5 times 48 millimeter drug looting stent using culotte technique. Then post dilatation of the left main LED stent by 3.5 times 20 millimeter NC balloon. And then rewiring and final kissing with 3.5 times 15 millimeter and 3.5 times 20 millimeter NC balloons in the post uh, uh, LED and LCX. And here is our final result. And the patient was off chest pain with good hemodynamics and no electrical instability. Our take home message here is complex anatomy and setting of STEMI represents a challenge. Revascularization is the gold standard treatment in STEMI. Increased evidence of complete revascularization in STEMI, whether during an index procedure or same <coughs> hospital stay. In complex multivessel disease, the revascularization procedure should be individualized according to the patient hemodynamics, coronary anatomy, and technical expertise. Thank you. Thanks so much. Uh, uh, so the case is open for discussion. So that's the, the first thing that comes to question is whether or not you were able to use imaging. Um, like IBIS? Yes. Uh, the, the, the culprit was the osteal uh, LCX, and it was pretty uh, obvious here. Mm -hmm. So uh, I, we don't have IBIS on shelf in our cast lab. Okay. We had to order it. Okay, that's, that's the answer. Yes. <laughs> okay. That's the true answer. Okay, perfect. Any, any other comments? Well, the, uh, the ostium of the left circumflex is the Achilles tendon of uh, distal left main uh, uh, bifurcation. But anyways, you didn't have it, you didn't have it, you had a good angiographic result, you had to save uh, uh, the patient. 
I, I, I will try to be uh, politically correct, uh, which is hard. Um, but, you know, we sit on panels with surgeons and we read the guidelines and everything, and we saw five <laughs> fantastic cases that were surgical turndowns. So um, I don't know what to say. I just think that uh, more and more the surgeons uh, talk the talk, but they don't walk the walk. And it falls on us to um, do the most difficult cases. Um, at, and uh, that's it. I cannot say it more politically correctly, because if, if I keep on going, I, I will get myself in trouble. Actually, I think it speaks to the, the, the turn down, surgical turn downs, and why the registry studies show better outcome with cabbage. The recent one that just came out that created controversy. Um, I do have a question. Um, uh, what was the decision making process for DK, uh, for, um, for Coulard versus DK Crush? Or DK some Crush? other technique? Yeah, in this case. Uh, we, in, in this STEMI case, we adopt to use a simple uh, technique, not too much technique like the DK Crush, because the STEMI patient we was feared that the patient has hemodynamic instability. So we do a simple kilot technique. We have the left main LAD and LSX, same size. Uh, so uh, we were more familiar with the kilot technique than the DK crush technique. I, I think that, uh, that that's a very interesting and controversial uh, question that comes up all the time. First of all, what you did was not the classic kilot because you used uh, the CERC as the main CERC branch, the main. which is an inverse kilot. Yes. <laughs> which I do all the time, and I haven't found any convincing or compelling reason not to do it, uh, especially if the angulation is favorable uh, the, uh, the way it is. Um, I believe that uh, this whole DK crash thing is a little bit shady, shaky. Uh, there's no reason in my mind that if you perform a, a well-executed culotte, that uh, the result should be any better than a DK crush, and um, it requires less balloon inflation, yes. less ischemic time, it's quicker. Uh, so I have absolutely no problem doing a uh, culotte in a situation like this. That's what like we this. think in the case lab, yes. More simple approach. Do you do a double uh, kissing for a culotte? Double kissing, you mean? Final kissing. So for example, in that situation, the first stent was in the CERC, rewire the LED, balloon the, into the LED. Do oh, yes, do yes, 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 yes. But the most important thing is to do a very well-placed uh, pot. The initial pot is very, very important so that you can open up uh, the stent struts uh, in all bifurcation techniques. Uh, and um, I don't do a final pot. I think it's more uh, of a cosmetic surgery. Uh, plastic surgery than anything else. I don't believe in this, uh, you know, um, oval, uh, not, I mean, asymmetrical expansion of the proximal balloon. If you do sequential inflations at high pressure and then you finish with a low pressure inflation at six atmospheres on both, then you don't distort uh, the, um, the main branch. But the critical key is to do a very good part initially before you recross. So I have a question for the panel. So the, the, the last data we have uh, with the DK crash is the, the, the DK crash 5 uh, with left main that was published a few years ago now. In, and then the EBC main, for some reason, the Europeans, I mean, you're European, Dimitris. So the Europeans refused to use uh, DK crash. So in EBC main, didn't provide an answer to the DK crash because it was used like in less than 10% of the cases in the two, in the two stands. So, I mean, I think that the jury's still out um, with uh, the jury's still out with the DK crash, right? I don't know if you, if you guys know anything else that I don't. Well, I mean, I, I think DK, I mean, Dimitri spoke to that, right? If, if the, that, that benefit of DK crush may go away if you're doing double, double kissing balloons in a coulot technique, you know? The idea of expanding uh, the, and prepar preparing the neocarina for your main branch stent. Uh, may take care of, of uh, or may provide equal benefit to the DK crush uh, technique, so. I, I think the most important thing about bifurcations is to, 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 to perform them perfectly and know where to recross and how to dilate them, so on and so forth, and especially in culotte, you need to know the uh, size of the uh, 
size uh, of, of the struts. So if you have a 5.0 uh, LED, uh, it's difficult to stretch the stand and if you load on a 5.0. So you really, really need to know uh, what stand you're using and then uh, uh, do it um, adequately. Uh, I was recently in a panel where people do more and more tap uh, instead of these more complicated um, uh, techniques. Uh, I don't think it's a crime. Uh, and especially if you have uh, a lot of mobility between the left main and the LED as they move, this is a, um, a recipe for uh, wrist stenosis. So this might be a situation where you can, you can do a tap instead of doing a more complicated uh, uh, technique as long as obviously you know what you're doing and you're covering all the stand stress. The problem with tap is that you may not be uh, it's not very easy to reaccess if you want it. But uh, my take on it is, uh, listen, uh, the average interventionalist in the United States does about 75, 50 to 75 PCIs. True bifurcations are 15%. Do the math. So in a whole year, an average intervention, and I don't, don't mean uh, in, in an insulting way, but these are the numbers. They do 10 bifurcation cases a year. You cannot be familiar with six or seven variations of two stand techniques by doing 10 a year. So learn one or two, uh, one provisional and one uh, standard uh, um, dedicated bifurcation technique and take it from there. With 10 bifurcations a year, you will not master uh, all the details and nuances of bifurcation techniques. Yeah, I would argue, though, Dimitri, that, that there are scenarios where one doesn't work, and you pointed one out, right, where you have, uh, you know, a large uh, LED, right, where it would not be a good idea, right? So, you know, I, while that makes sense, uh, there are situations where I think you need to be familiar with the other stand strategies to, to get good outcomes. I would uh, counter-argue that these are situations that uh, you, you should refer Oh, that, that, that if you do 10 bifurcations a year and you have a true 111 bifurcation or difficult angulations and so on and so forth, then this is probably a case. There's no shame in, uh, in, in referring to someone that does uh, more. The bifurcation situation in coronaries reminds me of the carotid uh, standing or carotid in the pterectomy where surgeons do 10 a year. You cannot have good results with 10 procedures a year. Um, unless there's any other comments, uh, we're right on time. So um, <clears throat> thank you all very much. And uh, Dimitri and Michael, if you want to continue this, uh, you can go outside. <laughs> and uh, best man wins, I hope. <laughs> okay, thank you all very much for coming.